Hi, my name is Howard Yoon. I'm a literary agent at the Gail Ross Literary Agency in Washington, D.C. I'm here with one of our clients, Laura Liswood, who's author of The Loudest Duck. Um, she is senior advisor at Goldman Sachs and secretary general at the Council of Women World Leaders at the Aspen Institute. Thanks for being here, Laura. Thank you, Howard. So, Laura, I think a lot of people w will ask you, uh, as you go on your book tour and your talks, what, does the, what is the loudest duck? What does that mean? Well, and a lot of people think diversity is sort of picking out two of each. It's what I call the Noah's Ark theory of diversity. And that really is only the first step. Uh, because, as I say in, in the book, uh, even when you have that Noah's Ark of two of each kind in the ark, uh, the giraffe is probably looking at the zebra and saying, boy, you're kind of funny looking. Mm -hmm. you know, and that has an impact in the organization. And the loudest duck itself comes from this whole idea and concept of what I call what grandma taught us. And by grandma, I mean all of those ways we learned about who we are and who others are. And even though we're all professional, we're all professional in the workplace, as I put it, we all bring grandma to work with us. So what does grandma teach you? And, and how does that differ when you mm -hmm. go from culture to culture, or different groups, dom dominant groups, non-dominant groups, and different sure. areas? Sure. The, the loudest duck actually comes from the notion that grandma might have taught, uh, let's say, American men, for example, that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, which means, of course, if you speak up, you get what you want. But if you go to Japan, grandma may well have taught you the nail that sticks out gets hit on the head, which, of course, is just the opposite of the squeaky wheel. And then when you travel on to China, uh, grandma may well have taught you uh, the loudest duck gets shot, mm -hmm. which is very much the opposite of mm -hmm. the squeaky wheel. And then, of course, many women in the world have been taught by grandma that if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. That's not the problem of diversity. The problem in diversity is that you have this very diverse organization. It's multicultural, it's global, whatever. And you're in a meeting. Howard, you're in the meeting, and you're running this meeting. And sitting at your table as part of your team is a wheel, a duck, a nail, and a nice. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that, generally speaking, that means that the only person talking is the wheel. One of the main points that you have in the book is that um, the distinction between dominant and non-dominant mm -hmm. and the fact that we're not just talking about people from China or people from Japan or people from the U.S. We're talking about different power structures, different dynamics. So it could be male versus female, uh, mm -hmm. Chinese versus Japanese. It, can you uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on, on who, which groups you're talking about, who's in that arc? Absolutely, we're not just talking about gender or race or um, nationality, uh, which are some of the typical things people think about when they think about diversity. But you know, we're talking about the golfer and the non-golfer. Mm. We're talking about the tall person or the short person. We're talking about what school you went to versus what school I went to. Yeah. Now, in the book, I say that doesn't mean all of you out there need to learn to play golf. What it's about is the manager being a little more conscious in a diverse organization that they have to be aware they could be unleveling the playing field for some people and not for others, subtly advantaging some, subtly disadvantaging others. Laura, you have a great um, section in here on this parable that you tell. Um, it's about an elephant and a mouse, and it really helps to encapsulate. I mean, I think you've got the, the Noah's Ark, you've got what Grandma <laughs> taught you, you have these great uh, handles for uh, understanding these issues mm -hmm. of diversity. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this parable? Because it's one of my favorite parts of the book. The elephant and the mouse concept is if basically that you are the elephant in the room, large elephant in the room, what do you actually need to know about the mouse in the room? Not much. Yeah. If you're the mouse in the room, little thing, what do you actually need to know about the elephant? Pretty much everything. And so what happens is in organizations is that the dominant group may well not have any idea what's happening with the non-dominant groups, the, the mouse, if you will. But the non-dominant groups know everything about the dominant groups. So it also means that the dominant groups have a tendency to think, well, this organization is a meritocracy. Why? Because I'm at the top of this organization. 
And no one at the top of an organization says, well, the reason I got to the top leadership of this organization is that I was subtly advantaged. Can you talk a little bit about the, the takeaway and the tools mm -hmm. that you offer? I think it's very important for people to get really good critical feedback. But we also know from in a diverse workplace that a person who is uh, not like you may not get the same kind of feedback as a person who's like you. Uh, often, for example, uh, men may be worried uh, that uh, women are going to cry when they get critical feedback, or women are worried that men might get angry if they get critical feedback. And uh, so one of the things that's really important is to make sure that you get this and that you heard correctly. Uh, I also think that it's a very good idea for people to, every couple of months, spend some time with the manager, uh, with their manager, and letting them know what they, th they think they're doing well. And then the manager can tell them maybe the three things that they want, might want to work on. Who should be reading this book and who do you think your audience is? This book really is, I think, for both people who are in the leadership roles and who want to see diversity succeed, who want to see that we're going to get the best out of everyone. And it's also for the individual who has a career, who wants to get ahead in an organization, who may be in, from the non-dominant group or maybe from the dominant group who needs to figure out how to best have the most tools in their own toolbox, because the people who can kind of succeed are the people who have the most tools in their own toolbox. We have the saying in publishing that uh, you want a book that's need to read, not nice to read. And I think, Laura, you've done that. There's, this is an absolute need to read book, uh, especially in this moment in time, politically, with global business, you know, really in any category. It's a business book, and yet it applies to so many other aspects of our lives. Maybe you can tell us why we really need to read this book now. The Loudest Duck gives us a really concrete way of looking at the world and a framework for us to understand some of the dynamics that are going on and hopefully to make us all more comfortable with some of those dynamics that are going on and to, for each one of us in this very diverse world to succeed.